All right, welcome everybody to another episode of Talking Trout. Uh, we got a great guest lined up tonight, Matt Mitro from the Wisconsin Department of Natural Resources. Um, just want to welcome everybody. My name is Mike Coor. I'm with the Wisconsin State Council of Trout Unlimited. Um, a couple of uh, housekeeping notes I wanted to, to mention before we jump into Matt's presentation tonight. Um, first and foremost, uh, I'm looking for a co-host to help assist with uh, putting together these Talking Trout episodes. Um, that would be either help, um, you know, finding guests and lining that that up or possibly help um, actually running the the um, the meetings and the interview section of this. So if you're interested in, in helping out with that, uh, reach out to me um, and I get in touch and uh, that would be appreciated. And um, the other thing that I wanted to mention is that um, uh, TU DARE, our Driftless Area Restoration effort, um, they're not having their symposium this year in person, but they've been doing uh, virtual online meetings. They had one, I think it was last week, they had a round. Um, I believe all those meetings are available on their on their website. Um, and then there's also a symposium tomorrow. Uh, there's meetings that'll run all day. There's various topics. I see, uh, I think Jason just put the link in the chat box. So if you're interested in, in some of those topics, I encourage you to, to click on that and check it out. Um, I know our guest tonight, Matt, he'll be on tomorrow. So um, if you didn't get enough enough beaver talk tonight, you can certainly check out his talk tomorrow. It'll be a little more Driftless centric. But uh, with that, Matt, I'm gonna turn it over to you and, and ask before you get going, if maybe if you could just give us a brief introduction about yourself and, and uh, how you got into the research side of, of natural resources. Sure, thanks, Mike. Um, so like I said, I'm with the DNR. I'm in the Office of Applied Science, I'm the fish research section based in Madison and working statewide on trout. And how I got into research, um, I guess it was something I kept an interest in after finishing graduate school. Um, briefly did some work on stock assessment in the, with the Atlantic States Marine Fisheries Commission, moved over to a postdoc with the EPA and kept in research since then. And um, after the EPA got back into trout here in Wisconsin, this is where I've been for a number of years now. Um, so tonight I want to talk about an ongoing project on beaver and trout in Wisconsin streams and just kind of give you an update of where we're at. And I'll start out by saying right up front, I do not have any grand conclusions on whether beaver are good or bad for streams. It's kind of pretty premature in the study to say anything to that effect. But I do want to just kind of give an overview of what we're doing how we got to what we're doing and start sharing some preliminary results from our past field season. So I'll start off with a couple of fish pictures. These are two of the main species we all fish for in Wisconsin streams. They like cold, clean water um, and gravel substrate, of course, is important for supporting wild, uh, wild populations, natural reproduction. Although with brook trout, we do see Successful reproduction in sandy streams as well when you have good upwelling. When it comes to beaver and trout, there are a lot of different opinions and they're very different, strong opinions. Um, if you look to the east or west of Wisconsin, North America, in mountainous areas where you have trout streams, beaver are generally considered beneficial in those areas. Doesn't mean everybody likes them, but overall they tend to be viewed as beneficial. Here in the upper Midwest, it's always been different. We're a very low gradient area. We don't have mountains like they do out in the West and the East. Um, so streams here, when they do get beaver acti activity in them and dams built, they do tend to back up quite a bit of water depending on the, you know, the stream and the locale in the state. So I guess a number of concerns that have been raised about beaver and the Midwestern trout streams include um, both, well, the persistence of dams, they tend to stay in streams a long time, um, the transience of pool habitat as they become silted in over time, they tend to fill in and you lose that pool habitat that may have initially provided a good fishery for trout. Um, siltation also covers important spawning gravel in some streams. You may have a loss of riparian vegetation 
This could remove shading from streams. It could destabilize stream banks and perhaps promote uh, stream bank erosion. There are concerns about effects of beaver on stream temperature, um, disruption to stream conductivity in terms of trout being able to move through stream systems. And then of course changes or concerns about potential changes in trout abundance and changes in the fish community structure in the stream. Um, our cold water streams are generally not diverse. They tend to have your better streams are just going to have maybe one or two trout species, model sculpin, that might be it. And as you do get streams degraded for whatever reason, you do tend to start getting more tolerant fish showing up. So this project came out of research recommendations that were in the Wisconsin's Beaver Management Plan, which was updated in 2015, and also in our Trout Management Plan, which was updated a couple of years ago. And this kind of came about, um, well, as we were discussing uh, updating beaver management. And I guess it, it was a fascinating process being involved in the beaver management plan. Um, really diverse group of people, a lot of diverse interests. And I guess fish and wildlife kind of came together, recognized the importance of beaver control in streams, and that's kind of maintained in both the beaver and trout management plan, but recognize that there are a lot of uncertainties um, about how beaver affect trout and trout streams. And a lot of this has been reflected in the literature. Um, a really good review paper came out a couple of years ago about uh, a lot of the unknowns about beaver, how they affect trout in the upper Midwest. Um, so those research recommendations got put in the beaver management plan um, through the research prioritization process in the DNR. It came up as a well, top priority, and that's um, what kind of led to this project. So on the right here is a map that's in the beaver management plan, and this shows the distribution of streams around the state that are maintained under free flowing condition. So we, the DNR and US Forest Service contract with wildlife services to maintain these streams free of beaver colonization so that they're free flowing. And currently, I think there are about 1800 miles of streams that we maintain as free flowing, and that's maybe constitutes about 14% or so of the roughly 13,000 miles of classified trout stream in the state. So relatively small proportion. And the map I have in the middle here shows the beaver management zones. Um, this is divided up by um, wildlife management. And we have streams may be maintained free flowing and all in the management zones A, B, and C. And we're, as part of the study, attempting to cover um, representative streams of those three management zones. So I'll just briefly state the objective of the study. This is to quantify the effects, both positive and negative, of beaver, beaver dams, and beaver dam removal on cold water stream habitat and trout populations in the different ecoregions of Wisconsin and the different beaver management zones. So there are two main experimental approaches that we're using as far as our fieldwork goes for this project. One of them is to allow beaver recolonization of free-flowing streams. So we're selecting streams and study sites among the different streams that we've been maintaining under free-flowing condition and removing that beaver control from the streams and allowing beaver recolonization. So documenting the condition of the streams as free-flowing and then how they change as beaver colonize the streams. And the vast majority of our study sites, as I'll show you, are of this type. The um, second approach we're using is just kind of coming at the question from the opposite perspective. And this is finding streams that are currently occupied by beaver, having multiple beaver dams, and ideally trout in them, and removing those dams, restoring free flowing conditions, and documenting the recovery of those streams. Um, this has been a little more challenging in that it's been difficult to find these types of study streams, but we do have a couple and I'll talk about them as well. So as we're out collecting field data for this project, we're collecting information on fish and habitat. Um, for fish data, we are electrofishing. We are collecting trout, um, collecting metrics on these fish, getting catch per effort estimates of abundance, in some cases, market capture estimates of abundance, getting information on size structure, growth, 
Um, we're also tagging fish in many streams to look at movement, uh, particularly if they're moving in or around through beaver dams. And also collecting information on fish community structure, um, which is often referred to as in um, a metric called index of biotic integrity. Um, again, with cold water streams having very few types of fish species in them, uh, basically no tolerant species. And then as streams become degraded, we tend to see more fish species in those streams. Uh, we're also collecting fish habitat data. And this involves collecting metrics on the dimensions, uh, stream dimensions, width, depth, um, sequences of riffles, runs, and pools, um, collecting information on substrate composition and riparian cover, shading, um, also measuring water temperature and flow. And then we're collecting metrics on beaver dams as well. So we're measuring the dimension and structure of beaver dams, how water flows through them. And most importantly, we're documenting where they occur on streams um, with GPS coordinates and identifying, so identifying where they are, how they're distributed among streams and how that, that changes over time. And our more recent addition to the field project has been the use of um, drone or unmanned aerial systems. And I'll have a few images from this as well to show you. Um, this has been a long time coming for the DNR, and it's um, still a very tightly regulated part of the DNR. Um, and we haven't had as much access to this technology as I would have liked. We just kind of got started this past year. Um, we only have, we have a drone within our research program, but only one person is authorized to use it, and uh, it's not me. So, and we had a person working with us last spring. Um, she wound up being for another job, so it took a while to get somebody else on. Uh, but we do have somebody now, and we are kind of anxious to get going with the aerial surveys um, as soon as the snow cover's gone around the state. So a brief recap of the 2021 field season, just to kind of give you a sense of how much field work is involved in this project. We visited 41 streams in one lake, about 120 stream visits or 140 fish surveys. Many of these just for trout, other ones index of biotic integrity surveys where we're surveying all fish species in the stream. I'm gonna talk a bit about some of our pit tag detection arrays in one stream. We measured a lot of beaver dams on 14 streams. Um, many of these were measured multiple times over the course of the year. Uh, did a lot of habitat surveys and started doing some aerial imaging of our streams. So I'm going to walk through a quick series of maps to kind of give you a sense of, um, well, how many sites we're working on now and just kind of the process involved in getting to where we are, um, which is kind of why these field projects sometimes take a long time to do, uh, particularly a project of this nature. So back in 2018, in the fall, we began the project and spent some time in the fall traveling around meeting with DNR biologists around the state to identify uh, potential study streams. And one of them, again, we were looking for um, free flow, streams maintained free flowing conditions and ideally trying to find some which had beaver on that could be removed. And one of the big concerns, particularly for letting beaver back on was that ideally the stream would have to be running through public land because there was generally not gonna be much uh, private landowner interest in having such a study being done on the stream where they live. So we went around, identified these sites, went out in 2019, surveyed these, and wound up dropping 15 of them um, for various reasons. Um, some streams were um, either maybe their access issues, uh, there was in some cases local opposition. Many of the beaver removal streams had issues with either there actually were no beaver there, um, maybe no trout there, maybe no beaver and trout, so things of that nature. 2020 went back out again. We um, had added six more to the beaver colonization that year and then added 10 more to evaluate as potentially being in the study. Um, six of those got dropped out, so we're back down again. Uh, but then by 2021, we added a few more. And I think we have a really, uh, pretty good representation of different types of streams in different parts of the state. And here I'm again showing these red symbols. Those are all the free flowing streams. We're allowing beaver recolonization. Uh, we don't have very many for looking at beaver removal. We've got um, 
there's actually only two, I have three showing them up here, but there are two that we're gonna be looking at this year. And I have a couple control streams shown on here, the purple symbols, those are ones that I'm working on directly, um, but there are a lot more control streams for which we're gonna have data for the study. And that's making use of the trend sites that are in our fish biologist survey around the state each year. And now the big issue is for all these streams where we're ideally gonna be studying the effects of beaver on them is having beaver show up. And that's been good in some areas, not so good in others. So I've same map overlaid or highlighted in yellow where we're currently seeing beaver activity as of 2021. And unfortunately, we've only got one stream in beaver management zone A, one stream in zone B where we've been seeing beaver activity. Uh, in zone A, that's the Ounce River up in Bayfield and Douglas County, and then Holmes Creek in Marinette County. But we've seen quite a bit of beaver activity down in zone C. Um, some up on Rocky Run in Pierce County, and then a lot of different streams down in the southern part of the Driftless area. And I'm gonna talk a bit about some of those in detail um, with some of the data we've been collecting over this past year. Um, first, I wanna give a show a few different slides of the different types of streams that are included in the study and some of the different fisheries issues in them. Uh, this is a picture of one of our Lake Superior tributaries. Um, so we do have a few study sites up in Bayfield County that flow into Lake Superior. Um, here we're actually, well, these are streams that are very important for um, nursery areas for Lake Run Salmonids that is Lake Superior. So they're um, important for supporting, or thought to be important for supporting coho fisheries and steelhead fisheries in Lake Superior. Uh, these streams um, do have a lot of gravel in them, but they also have a lot of clay. And when they do flood, they tend to run a bit red. And one of the concerns with beaver dams in these streams is that that clay tends to get caught in dams and hardens up over time. Um, one of the interests of having beaver dams in streams like this is what it can do to benefit stream resident brook trout. Um, there are resident brook trout in these streams, um, but not providing the brook trout fisheries that perhaps they could if they had different types of habitat supported by beaver. So that's one of the things we're looking at there. Uh, this is a stream in Lincoln County, so the north central part of the state. This is Armstrong Creek, and we're gonna um, look at this one this year for potential uh, for removing beaver dams to restore free flowing conditions. And this stream is kind of uh, shows you to what extent beaver dams can really change the system when you have very low gradient. Um, you can kind of see in uh, see my cursor, but there's a you know a dam here in the middle of this picture, and this is at a high water period. I think it was last spring, um, but it really backs up the stream quite a bit and creates these just enormous areas of water. Uh, the picture to the right is the same stream, maybe a mile or less downstream of the picture on the left um, and showing what the stream looks like downstream and less influenced by the beaver activity. This is a stream in Marinette County. Um, so in Northeast part of Wisconsin, we tend to have some of these streams, a lot of streams that run through cedar swamp habitat. Again, another relatively low gradient area, um, a lot of brook trout in these waters. One of the characteristics of these waters and low gradient streams like this one is that when you do get precipitation events, the water levels tend to rise relatively slowly and fall relatively slowly. So they can stay at these elevated levels at bank full for extended periods of time. Um, but you generally don't get the strong flashy floods that might you know, potentially destabilize or wash out beaver dams. So this is one of the issues that's um, why many are against having beaver dams and streams in this part of the state is that those dams do tend to persist over long periods of time. Um, as an example is my um, predecessor at Avery had done some work on in this part of the state on the North Branch from a Bonwan. And over the course of his study, they removed somewhere upwards of 600 beaver dams over a 20-something you know, mile length of stream. So, these streams can get changed pretty significantly by beaver activity. And then lastly, um, a driftless area stream. This is um, Spring Coolby down in um, Vernon County. And kind of just illustrating the type of streams that you see in this area, it's a much higher gradient compared to other parts of the state. Um, flooding here tends to be very flashy, and quite detrimental. And 
when you do have these flash, flash flood events, you can get significant uh, stream bank erosion in these streams. So somewhat different than other parts of the state. So I'm gonna move into some of our results from the uh, past year or past couple of years. And I wanna start off with fish movement. And this is some work we did in Marinette County in a stream called Upper Middle Inlet. And uh, this is work that was actually led by um, one of my coworkers, Emma Lundberg, who was a, she did this as part of her PhD work out of UW-Madison. Um, she worked on a number of different things in her PhD and this uh, provided data for one of her chapters. And so the map here is Upper Middle Inlet, flows into Lake Nakabay. The um, red symbols show areas where we did electrofishing to tag and recapture trout. And we had, uh, we were tagging these trout with pit tags and we set up two pit tag detection arrays, the purple symbols, which when they're operating, provide continuous um, scanning of the waters to detect any fish, tag fish that might be moving in either direction. And the rationale behind looking at this work was the concern that um, seasonal movement is, might be quite significant in this part of the state. Uh, this is water temperature data from up the middle inlet from 2019 through 2020, so showing a winter time period. And conditions in this part of the state during winter can be quite harsh. Uh, these streams tend to freeze over and remain at or near freezing for very long periods of time during the winter. Um, quite the opposite of what we see in, for example, driftless area streams in the southeast, southwestern part of the state. And in some of the early work that I had done in this part of the state from Brook Trout Age Growth, we had where we were trying to get in these streams early in spring to uh, tag fish, um, we were finding a lot of sections of the stream did not have fish early in the spring. Fish would tend to move in here as waters warmed up. And when we did tag fish and come back in subsequent years, we would never find these tag fish. So it um, seemed clear that these fish were moving and redistributing themselves, but we didn't know as to what extent this movement was important. So that's why we're doing the study. And it's kind of get, trying to get at the issue of to what extent or how important is it to maintain the connectivity in these streams as opposed to allowing beaver colonization and having dams in the streams that might disrupt the ability of trout to move. Um, so we are looking at other streams where beaver dams are present to see whether or not and to what extent trout move through them. Um, but in this case, it's a free flowing stream and documenting the seasonal movement of trout. So we set up these pit tag detection arrays in two parts of the stream. Uh, they're stored in these cases, stream side, run off batteries. Uh, we had solar panels up to help keep them charged during the summer or during the non-winter months. Over the course of a couple of years, I guess beginning in 2019, we tagged about 1,500 trout. We recaptured or detected about 28% of those tagged fish from one to four times, some up to 30 times and detect a movement up to about 12 kilometers. So I'm gonna show you a couple examples of some of these long distance movements that we saw. Um, but first I'll show you this um, figure here. So this is a figure showing river distance on the left and time on the bottom axis. And the circles are observations of trout connected with lines showing um, where they were first detected and subsequently detected. And I like this figure because I think it's web-like nature kind of shows the complexity of movement in the system. This is, um, this is one of the fish that we detected moving at least 12 kilometers. So this was a fish we tagged in November, 2020 during the spawning season. Um, this fish presumably moved downstream over winter. Uh, we didn't have our pit tag detection array running that winter between say mid-December into mid-March. Um, when we didn't get the big tag detection array, uh, here showing the lower one up and running again in March, 2021, we detected this fish moving back upstream. So presumably it went downstream searching for overwinter habitat. And then we physically recaught the fish again in April, uh, 2021. So this fish moved at least 12 kilometers. Um, another one, fish we first caught in September 2020. This fish moved upstream during the spawning season. We detected going through one of our pit tag arrays and then went back down after November and we caught this, caught this fish again 
in December, officially moved to almost eight kilometers. And another one, this is when we tagged at an upstream location in September, 2020, again, during spawning season. Uh, this fish was detected moving downstream through one of our pit tag detection arrays. And then we physically recaptured it further downstream in December. Um, so again, a fish potentially moving to open water habitat. Um, and again, you might be noticing I, a lot of these figures, I just show one of our pit tag detection arrays. It's a, the, that pair of lines here, and they're set up this way so that you can detect directional movement. Um, it is possible that some of these fish do get by some of these detection arrays undetected. Um, if we do um, have battery issues that they're running out or need to be changed, or um, sometimes it's just a detection error that a fish can slip through without being detected. So it's great when it works, but it's you know not perfect, but I think it did do a good job of uh, capturing a lot of these fish movements. Um, one final issue you want to talk about with uh, Upper Middle Inlet, it does collect and they connect to Lake Nakabe. And there's a lot of thought that these fish are potentially overwintering in Lake Nakabe. Uh, we've talked to a lot of people who live in the area, people who fish up there, and certainly have heard reports of people catching trout in the lake. Um, we did attempt to do some ice fishing for them, didn't catch any trout. Uh, we did go out with fike nets one time this past fall. Um, we did try to go out a second time, but the lake had frozen over by that time. Um, so we set up some fike nets in the outlet of Upper Middle Inlet, um, just to kind of see if we can do it and what we might catch. We didn't catch any trout, but we did catch some mottled sculpin um, pretty close to the lake. So uh, clearly this, there was cold water habitat suitable for trout if mottled sculpin were there. Um, the DNR is doing a full creel survey in Lake Nakabe this year. I think it's starting in March, um, so this month. And that'll run through uh, the next 12 months. So we'll ideally be finding out to what extent anglers are catching trout in Lake Nakabe, either in the open water season or on the ice. And since we have been pit tagging a lot of these fish, <clears throat> we're gonna have the creel clerks um, have a pit tag scanner with them in case anybody does have a trout that they kept to see if um, those might be one of our tagged fish. Uh, moving on, I'll show you a bit some of our habitat data um, here, focusing on substrate data. And this is a stream called LePage Creek. This is in Florence County. And this is one um, Emma, who was working with us at the time, found out from Wildlife Services that there were some beaver dams in the stream that they're about to remove. And we were able to get in that stream before they took the dams out to collect some habitat data and then go in subsequently to document how it recovered after becoming free flowing again. So on the bottom figure here on the left, I'm showing a stream width. Um, these figures don't capture the meandering of the stream, but simply show um, at the zero point on the left axis where the beaver dam is and how wide the stream is upstream of the beaver dam versus downstream. And then after the dam was removed in 2020 and 2021, um, seeing that the stream channel revert, revert back to its natural uh, narrower form. And in the substrate figures on the upper left, so what we're showing here is the, the different coarseness of the substrate. So the, from more coarse to less, we were looking at bedrock, boulder, rubble cobble, gravel, sand, silt clay, and detritus. And so the warmer colors are indicative of finer uh, substrates and the cooler colors indicative of coarser substrate with the uh, sand kind of in the middle shown in yellow. And it should be pretty obvious on the <laughs> figure on the left, when you look at the upper part of the figure upstream of the beaver dam, uh, this is the areas where we do get a lot of siltation, a lot of sediment settling, and a loss of the coarse gravel substrate or coarse gravel rock rubble substrate in that area. Whereas downstream the beaver dam, you don't tend to see that. And you do have more of the uh, gravel and sand and the substrate that's a little, um, more suitable for supporting wild populations of trout. So after this dam was removed in fall of 2019, in 2020 and 2021, went back there and you can see the kind of the recovery of that section above where the dam used to be. So a lot of that sediment started to get flushed out and start to see more sand and even gravel start to show up over time. Uh, so kind of an example of a stream substrates recovering after the removal of dam and restoring free flowing conditions. 
Uh, now I'll share a little bit from a stream down in the southwestern part of the state. Uh, this is Big Spring Branch in Iowa and Grant County. And this here is one of our aerial images we captured with our drone. And it's the, the images from our drone are kind of shown in that center uh, part of the figure shown in the stream channel. And I guess this was overlaid on top of a, an existing map. Um, but for those not familiar with it, on the left here is a road crossing the upper part of Big Spring. If you look to the right of this, um, move some stuff on my screen here. There's a, if my cursor showing it, there's a big spring comes out of the hillside, flows through, there's a big beaver dam area in here. There are a number of dams throughout this portion of the stream. There's another big one down here, following my cursor. Another one showing up here. Uh, there's some we weren't aware of this past year until we saw the drone images uh, further down over in this part. And there are even some way down by Pine Tree Road. There's actually a dam just south or just downstream of the bridge, kind of backing it up to the upstream of the bridge. Uh, so there's been quite a bit of beaver activity in this area. Um, this is a, we've included it in the study because it's, you know, because of the beaver activity there, but the fish managers in the area had decided that this was something they wanted to do independent of the study, uh, potentially to help recover uh, brook trout. Uh, so I'll show you some substrate data from Big Spring. Um, so this is a section, this is just upstream of Big Spring Road Bridge, but it's downstream of the beaver dams that are upstream of Big Spring Road Bridge. Uh, so it's this aerial image is showing the portion of the stream where we collected this data. And this is kind of interesting. You get a, there's a fair amount of kind of big boulder rubble, rubble cobble substrate throughout here, gravel mixed in. And you do get quite a few pockets of silt and sediment in different areas, um, but a very diverse, excuse me, very diverse substrate. And this is an image of the up, upstream of the beaver dam upstream from that previous section. And on the left here, I'm showing two aerial images. The one on the bottom shows the beaver dam. This is one of the bigger ones on, on Big Spring. And it um, kind of extends over here, creates a lot of big backwater area, which is kind of set off to the side of the stream. And this pool runs pretty much all the way up to the spring that comes out of the hillside. So the upper figure shows uh, if you can see my cursor moving around, that's where the big spring dumps into the stream. Um, so you have a little bit of kind of riffle habitat here, and then it's just a big long pool. Uh, so you do get a lot of silt and sediment settling in this pool. And of course, one of the concerns is that if this beaver dam persists for a long period of time, and you don't get any high flow events flushing out sediments that it could potentially start filling in. Uh, so this is something we'll be able to see as we survey this habitat over time. But again, a lot of uh, sediment pretty much predominating the substrate through most of the pool upstream of the beaver dam. Uh, you do tend to see some of the larger substrates, the boulders and some rubble cobble, but you don't get any gravel until you get pretty much up near the end of this section of the stream. <clears throat> this is some, I'm going to show you a couple of pictures of fish we caught in that big pool. And um, there were some really nice fish in there. And this is one of the reasons why some people really do like uh, beaver dams on their streams and that they can create big, really big pool habitat in streams that otherwise wouldn't have it. And fish can respond very well to this. And um, this is one example. Um, there actually weren't very many brook trout in there. I think we only caught about five and uh, they all kind of looked like this. Uh, but most of the fish in that pool turned out to be brown trout and a lot of them looked like this. So this figure here shows kind of the length frequency of the fish that we did see in these uh, two sections of the stream. So the one on the top is upstream of the beaver dam and the picture of the area over to the left. Um, so again, we saw a lot of bigger fish uh, kind of in the eight to 14 inch range. We were seeing fish up to about 17 inches or so. Uh, again, 97% of these fish were brown trout. Um, we didn't see very many brook trout and didn't see very many young of year fish in that area as well. Um, downstream of that, in this picture at the bottom left, which is essentially immediately downstream from the beaver dam, uh, quite a bit different. Uh, again, you don't have that big pool habitat. 
you do have quite a number of trout down there, but they tend to be smaller. So you have a lot in the kind of six to 10 inch range. And you do have a lot of young year fish down in that area. So I think one of the concerns about the beaver dam and what it means for the pool above it is the lack of spawning up there. Um, so you just don't have the spawning habitat. So you're not getting a lot of young year fish there. And then with all these big fish in that pool, certain some of them could be feeding on them as well. Uh, so it'll be interesting to see over time what happens with the side structure in this um, pooled area and what happens with trout recruitment. Because uh, we have been doing a lot of tagging in the streams, so if these fish are moving in either direction through the dam, we'll be able to pick that up over time as well. Uh, so moving on, I want to talk a little bit about Otter Creek in Sauk County. Um, this is a stream that kind of comes out through the Baxter State Natural Area. And we initially started looking at this this past year as a potential stream for removing beaver dams, or if not, for having a control stream with beaver dams on it. Uh, this is a stream that, if you actually look at an aerial image of the stream on Google Maps, you can see the area where there's a big beaver dam. Uh, so we went in here in April, just kind of scouted out to see what was in there for trout and what was in there for beaver dams. Uh, my field crew got a little excited about some of the non-trout species we saw. Uh, this is a central stone roller, which we don't come across very often in our trout streams. Uh, this is a spawning male uh, with a lot of tubercles on it. And then we also saw some stoneflies. Again, um, I don't typically see very many stoneflies in many of our streams, but I could just be going to some of the wrong streams. So we found some beaver dams in the stream. Um, if you're I don't know if you're familiar with the area or not, but there's a road that goes in along Otter Creek uh, from Sauk up into the Baxter State Natural Area. And if you go as far as you can up that road, it then turns and crosses Otter Creek. And if you stand on that little bridge and look upstream, this is what was there. Um, so there was a dam. Uh, the bridge is literally just off the side of this image. Um, so there was a dam right there. Uh, but this wasn't the dam we were seeing on the Google images. Um, those were further upstream. This is the one that we kind of got excited about. Uh, so this is maybe another, I don't know, 100, 150 meters or so upstream from that road. Um, quite a large pond formed by a, a beaver dam. Um, unfortunately, it's a little bit remote in terms of getting into it with equipment. Um, it's not something you can wade in and survey. Um, so we really haven't quite figured out how it could be surveyed. Um, Nevertheless, we went in to take a look at it, and this is what it um, this is what it looks like. If you go upstream from this, um, back in this hillside here on the backside of this pond, this is what you see. There's really not much stream habitat up there. Um, so there's a little bit of stream habitat you see on the left here, but if you get a little further back, it's just kind of bare rock. Um, it could be that this was kind of a low water period, drought type period. I'm sure water rips through here when you do get um, heavy rain events, but not much in the way of fish habitat. Although there probably are some springs coming in as well. So, you know, removing beaver dams from a stream, ideally it would be to open up habitat to, you know, improve the stream for fish. But in the case of Otter Creek, Removing that big beaver dam probably would not open up very much habitat for trout. So it's probably not anything I would recommend doing. And plus, given that it's in a state natural area, I think there's a lot of interest in maintaining it the way it is. So our intention is simply to kind of use a stream as a control type site. But I want to show you some fish data and some habitat data from areas downstream of that large dam. So this is a portion of the stream downstream of that bridge I talked about. Uh, this is a free flowing section of Otter Creek. Um, it's kind of unusual compared to many driftless streams that I've been on. And that's a very large substrate. Um, it's just a lot of boulders in this area. Um, and rubble cobble, a little bit of gravel mixed in, very little in terms of fine sediment. When we went back to do that, this was in June. And we looked at the um, area upstream of the bridge and found that the beaver dam was actually taken out. Uh, so this is kind of fortuitous in a way in that it made it very easy for us to sample. And 
So if, this is a pictures, two different time periods, but the same site. So on the bottom left is when we first scouted this area out in April and the beaver dam was present backing up water. And then on the right is in June when we went back to do our summer survey. And you can kind of see the footprint of the dam, uh, the pond behind the dam had disappeared as this was drained out. And it turned out uh, we ran into a Sauk County Highway guy who came out while we were there. And it turned out they took the dam out the day before we got there. Um, so it had just been taken out. Uh, the rationale was it was backing water up and about to kind of overflow this road. Uh, it's kind of surprising that that road was of interest because it really doesn't go anywhere or except to a little parking area. But be that as it may, Sauk County saw to take the dam out. Um, unfortunately for them, they did not remove the beaver. So within one day, beaver were actually rebuilding this dam. And uh, the guy was not too happy to see that. But we were very happy to be able to survey this area. So <clears throat> what we found here again was what you typically see behind beaver dams, a lot of uh, silt, silt and sediment backed up. Um, and then again, as you get further upstream from the impact effects of the dam, you can start to see some of the larger substrate. And if you look at the top figure where a field crew is walking around doing some of our surveying, you can see a lot of the sediment that gets kicked up. And again, this is um, typically one of the things we see when you do get uh, beavers slowing down water in these uh, Midwestern streams. Um, as far as fish that we saw in these, or trout, in the stream. Um, it was all brook trout. And the downstream section, the free flowing stream through this forested area, uh, there were a fair number of trout. Uh, catch per effort was about 45 per 100 meters. But these were mostly small fish. Um, this was June. We were catching some of the young a year that were just showing up. These are mostly these two inch fish. Um, there were a lot of fish in the four to five inch category. These would have been age one fish that had just gone through their first winter. And there are very few bigger fish than that. So not a stream that many anglers would be interested in. Um, but quite a bit different upstream of the beaver dam. Uh, so here there were a lot more somewhat bigger fish for this stream at least, uh, many in that kind of five to eight inch range, one up to 10 inch. Um, essentially no young a year up there. So again, this is one of the concerns when you have beaver dams in our streams, is that disrupting the recruitment process? And I don't know how long that dam was there. Um, if those fish perhaps got trapped up there and were able to grow, um, if the dam had persisted, what would happen over time? Uh, so this is one thing we're going to be looking at in different streams where beaver dams occur. And the last stream I want to talk about is Elk Creek in Vernon and Richland County. And this is a stream. This is actually the first stream I ever worked on when I came to Wisconsin, starting back in 2004. And uh, this is just an aerial image, I, not one that we took, but took off the um, uh, DNR surface water data viewer. And just because it zooms out enough to show the scope of the stream that we are, have been surveying over time. And my interest in the stream years ago was relative to stream habitat restoration work that was being done back in 2005. Uh, so that was how we selected these study sites. We kept them up over time just to follow temporal trends of trout. Um, so we have these two sites up on DNR-owned property, um, site three and four, and kind of in the mid-reach of the stream, and site five further downstream. And these red symbols are beaver dams that have been showing up over the past couple of years. So beaver actually started showing up on here before the beaver trout study proper started, and that was back in fall of 2017, and this dam all the way over to the right near site one showed up that fall. And then over time, beaver started spreading and becoming more prevalent in the system. Um, and for whatever reason, they were not being removed. And then when the study started, we decided to make sure that they were, or to use the stream as part of the study and keep them in there. Uh, so we started seeing a lot of beaver activity in the upper part of the stream. Um, this cluster up here is all on DNR, uh, state owned property. Uh, the second cluster down here is on easement land. Um, landowners down near sites three and four are not very much interested in beaver. Um, so they have been some taken out there. Uh, further downstream, this cluster is on Tenney Spring Creek, a tributary to Elk Creek. 
Now, there are a couple more in Elk Creek itself, and then all the way over near Site 5, these are all in small tributary down in that part. So I'm going to zoom in on part of this um, in a second. Now, this is a, a first of this is an image that we took. So again, the um, stream portion of it kind of running through the center of this overlaid on an existing map. And this shows what the stream actually looks like as of, I think this was last May, April or May, last spring. Um, so if you can follow my cursor, um, this here kind of in the center is where our site one, survey site one is, and there was a beaver dam near the bottom end, or just downstream the bottom end of that site. Um, a lot of beaver dam, um, um, my cursor is heading to the left here, um, a lot of beaver dams for this section. Um, Big pool here, big pool here. There's a really cold tributary that comes in. Um, then again, flowing downstream, intermittent beaver activity. And if you get to the left of this image, there's a big cluster of beaver dams that's on easement land. And uh, that's the portion I'm gonna zoom into. Uh, so one of the things we did this past summer to try to get a sense of what was happening with stream temperature at kind of a finer scale, um, typically, with the data loggers in the stream, it might just be one or two at very uh, disparate locations. But here we put a lot in a small area. Uh, we actually put more out than this, but we did lose some. In fact, uh, there was one that a beaver actually chewed and removed and kindly left it sitting on the bank. So it just recorded air temperature for the uh, one month duration we had the these out there. But we did this from mid July to mid August, so kind of the hot part of the summer uh, to see what was happening. And so here, site or data logger one is at the upstream end, six at the downstream end, kind of flows through a series of dams and pools. And what we found, not surprisingly, was that over the course of the stream, uh, water temperature was increasing. Now, to some extent, this is not surprising in that when water is exposed to air and over, especially during the summer, it's gonna warm. Um, so the real question that we need to try to get at is, is the rate of warming any different because there are beaver dams there versus having free flowing conditions? Now I'm going to zoom back out. And so here, that temperature data was from this cluster of beaver dams in the middle of the figure. But here I have uh, shown in blue two symbols showing water temperature data loggers that I've been maintaining since back in 2011. Um, I've had one out longer than that, but that's as long as we've had the pair out there. So again, this one upstream is near our survey site two, and then we have another one downstream at survey site four. And what we've seen is kind of interesting. The, um, on this figure on the bottom, the temperature at site two is shown in this light blue color. And for the first uh, maybe five, six, seven years of this time series, Water temperature is actually about, on average, two degrees cooler at the downstream location than the upstream location. So this is a uh, July mean temperature that I'm showing here um, with, I think these are 95% confidence intervals. Um, this is not that unusual for many of our streams in Wisconsin, uh, particularly in the Driftless area where you do have a lot of groundwater input. Uh, so over the course of many of these streams, temperature can go down because of water or groundwater added to the streams. What gets interesting is what happens after beavers started colonizing, um, particularly in this area between sites two and four. So again, we saw the first beaver dam, which was just upstream of site two in the fall of 2017, and they really kind of got going over the next few years. And so since that time that beaver activity has been here, these, the difference in temperature between that upstream and downstream location has been converging to the point where it's actually slightly, although maybe not significantly warmer at the downstream site than the upstream site uh, this past year in 2021. Um, so this would kind of suggest that perhaps uh, beaver are having an effect on water temperature in the stream. Um, again, there's a lot more to tease out of this data set. Um, we still need to consider what has been happening with air temperature over time and precipitation, um, but clearly something's changed. Um, it had been, really consistent that water temperature was cooler at the downstream location compared to the upstream location. Uh, but again, in the past few years, this has changed. And I'll finish up by showing some fish survey data from Elk Creek. Um, again, we've been collecting this data since 2004. Um, back then, sites one, two, and 
five were considered degraded sites. Those were sites of stream restoration work. So abundances were very low back then. After the restoration work was done, they tended to recover. In general, there was an increase in trout abundance um, into 2010, and then a decrease thereafter, and then a little bit of an increase going to 2020. Uh, this map I have up in the upper right, uh, one of my DNR colleagues, a uh, postdoc, Dr. Brian Maitland has been working on some of our uh, statewide trout data. He presented on this uh, last week at the Driftless Symposium, and this is one of the figures that he had put together for that. And I showed here just to kind of show that it, that our uh, statewide trends in trout kind of corroborate what we've been seeing in Elk Creek, that kind of increase around 2010, decrease followed by increase again. Um, but do note the difference in scales. So, so he's looking at all the statewide data. He has a scale here of H1 and older trout numbers per mile. Um, I tend to, um, to express catch per effort in closer to the length of stream that we actually do the surveys in. So I'm doing it in uh, trout per 100 meters, although we survey a little bit longer stretches than that. Um, if you were to convert this, these numbers here from per 100 meters to per mile, um, this 100 would be 1,600, this 200 would be 3,200. So Elk Creek is really one of those off the scale type streams where um, we really do have large abundances of trout. Um, but one of the interesting data points here is this kind of oddball number at site two in 2017. Uh, so this is just downstream of the beaver dams that started showing up in 2017. And it was a really high abundance. And I kind of think what's probably happening um, with the, that initial beaver activity in the stream, it would, you know, could have potentially been disrupting movement dynamics. Uh, again, this is during October when uh, spawning activity is taking place and fish may be moving around. Uh, so it could be that movement dynamics were affected, leading to this uh, very high observation that we saw at that site at that time. But um, I guess just to finish up, we will be continuing this project again for the next few years, foreseeable future. Um, in 2022, we're looking forward to revisiting many of these sites, um, continuing work on trout population dynamics and fish community composition, um, hopefully getting ready a lot of that, that data to present in the coming year. Uh, we're still doing work on trout movement. Uh, we're no longer going to be, well, we'll probably maintain the pit tag detection arrays and upper middle inlet into the summer, um, since we do a lot of tagged fish out there, but we're no longer putting tags out there. Um, but we are doing this type of movement work in other streams where dams are present with the intention of trying to see to what extent uh, dams act as a barrier to fish movement or not. Um, continue our work with changes in physical stream habitat and more, a lot more to come on water temperature. I wanna finish up by acknowledging my amazing field crew I've had for the past two years. Uh, now, Dr. Emma Lundberg on the left, Mariana Matea, Nick Hoffman, and Ben Breaker. Um, unfortunately for me, and fortunately for them, Emma has recently taken a position with U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service in Green Bay. She's going to be working on brook trout streams up in northeastern Wisconsin in the UP. And Ben is now a uh, DNR fish biologist at uh, Plymouth. So that, I will leave you with a picture of big brown trout. And if there's time, happy to answer questions. Oh, that was great, Matt. Really, really appreciate you taking the time to, to walk us through that. And uh, it's, it's pretty interesting to see how, how fast things can change out there in the landscape. Um, I had a couple of questions come in. Um, that if you got a little bit of, a, of time here, I think we're, we're at what, just before nine o'clock. Let's, uh, let's dive right into this. Yeah. Here's, a, here's not necessarily study related, but maybe you have, um, you can provide some guidance or maybe um, give an idea to this landowner of where they could go to find some guidance. Uh, it says, our family owns some property in Buffalo County, the class two trout stream with many beaver dams on it. In our case, the dams appear to be causing severe stream bank destabilization. Is there any guidance on how to remove beaver dams to begin to restore these stream banks? Do you guys have, is, is there, do you have resources for landowners who are dealing with some of these issues? Um, yeah, I think there are a lot of resources out there. I guess I'd probably encourage them to contact the local fish biologists first. Um, they would probably be the most knowledgeable about who does that type of work in that area and how they could get help. Yep, 
that's a good place to start for sure. Um, how long do you anticipate the study to last? I think to some extent this will last as long as I'm employed at the DNR. Um, we, um, I think at the moment we have it kind of penciled out to 2026 um, with the understanding that portions of the project like you will continue longer. Um, again, one of the big concerns is that the effects of beaver on streams could potentially be beneficial initially, but then over time become detrimental. So we want to be careful not to stop the study too short and declare everything great when perhaps it's not. So I think to some extent, this will be, uh, at least portions of the project will be continuing for a long time. Yeah, Although maybe good, uh... not. It may not be all at the same level that we've been putting into the past couple of years. But... No, that makes sense. And I, I've heard that too, anecdotally. You know, you see, like you said, you see like fish get really big in some of these pools right away. And then it, it takes, you know, it's like 10 or 15 years later that the stream is really starting to show that degradation from it. So I think it'd be important for you to, you know, if we're going to draw conclusions from this, you know, we probably need some long-term data to, to back those up. Um, with that being said, you know, understanding that we do have a beaver management plan that gets updated every 10 years. I think the next one runs through 2025. Is there, it, are your studies going to be tied into like that next 10 years of beaver management or, or do you think you won't be able to draw enough conclusions by that time? Um, I'm not expecting to draw all our conclusions by that time, but I think in, from my experience in the process of updating management plans, we certainly make use of any available data that we have. So I would say whatever we have up at that point will probably be you know, considered. Um, looks like we got a couple of folks here from uh, Michigan DNR, which is pretty cool. Um, and it says, uh, there's so many implications of this research I'm interested in, such as the correlation to slope, combining the distance traveled with beaver dam demographics, um, to look at landscape scale implications, and a whole lot more questions. They ask, what's the best way for Michigan DNR to follow up with you? We got contact info you want to share? You want to? Or I, I suppose I could put it, we'll put this on our YouTube channel. If you don't mind, I could put a link to your email. Yeah, um, it's just matthew.mitra at wisconsin.gov. Um, I'm sure it's on our DNR contact you know, web pages as well. But Yeah, that sounds good. Start with an email and, and we'll go from there. Um, <laughs> Here's a, here's a question from back in the beginning. He said, did you open by saying other states view beaver pre presence differently? I believe you did, but maybe could you elaborate right. on that a little bit? Yeah, um, I guess as an example, back in 2019, I went to American Fishery Society meeting um, out west in Nevada and there was a whole symposium on beaver and streams. And I sat through most of it and I think every single presentation I heard was positive about beaver. Um, so in many of those mountainous areas, um, particularly in dry areas as well, beaver are considered um, beneficial to streams in many ways. And again, with the higher gradients they tend to have out there, I don't think they encounter the same types of issues we do in the upper Midwest. Um, so, and, and it's actually to the point where in Many places out west, there's some, in some cases, they may translocate beaver to get them established in streams, or they may use something called beaver dam analogs, so kind of an artificial beaver dam. Yeah, I had heard that too. It's interesting that some places where we're trying to get them out as fast as we can, and, and there's other places out west where they're trying to reintroduce them with a stream and establish some of these, you know, deeper pools and, and maybe some of the wetlands and back channels that they do create. Um, I had a question about, about some of the maps and some of the streams that um, that you were including in the study. And it looked like there, there were very few streams that were classified as like beaver removal streams. Could you maybe revisit that point and explain why it is that there 
there were so few streams that were included in that beaver removal area? Is that because we've we've done so much of it already that that data exists already, or or is there a different reason for that? Um, yeah, that's pretty much it. We've <laughs> We've really focused a lot of our beaver control program on our better trout streams. And, you know, certainly there are beaver out on streams. Um, in many cases, it might be on private land and the landowner has no interest in removing them um, because they like beaver because they create ponds and attract ducks for hunting, for example. Um, but yeah, it's just, Trout streams with beaver dams on them are not that prevalent. Sure. That's not to say there's not beaver showing up on trout streams. Um, I know Wildlife Services is very busy in the work that they do. Um, but again, it's the streams where beaver have been present for many, many, many years. There's, and as far as those being trout streams, there's not as many. Gotcha. That makes sense. Yeah. Yeah. You're trying to find a you don't want to jump in halfway through a process, right? If you're going to try to draw conclusions from a study, you want something that's that's natural, and then you can see the change over time. That does make sense. I see Frank Pratt's got his hand raised. Frank, I'll give you the floor. Do you really want to hear from me? Because you're going to hear the manager's perspective as opposed to the research perspective, which Matt knows knows he's going to hear because a researcher always says, "Give me 22 more years to study it, and I might give you a conclusion." And a manager says, tell me what you think it means and I'll do it yesterday. Uh, I think we've had an ongoing 50 to 55 year deep beaver study going, going all the way back to when we first started classifying streams in Wisconsin, which I believe was the early 70s. And if you compare the trout distribution and abundance data from many of these streams from 1970 versus 2020, you're going to see that there are a tremendous number of natural brook trout streams, particularly up in my country in Northwest Wisconsin, that used to be good brook trout streams that aren't even trout streams anymore. Uh, and I'm convinced that the, the greatest villain is, is beaver. Uh, I would say that there must be some situations where beaver are beneficial. I would have to say though in 50 years, I'd get to encounter one. Yeah, I don't disagree with you. Um, if I had to guess the areas where they might be beneficial, I would probably say some of the driftless area streams where you do have the higher gradient. And we've certainly seen the lack of persistence of dams in that area when we have these really strong flood events. And in fact, it happened on Big Spring during the course of the study. I didn't get into it here. And on Tenney Spring Creek as well, where we documented dams being built and then flood events happened and they were removed. And you're right, you don't see that very often up where you are in uh, you know, the Hayward area. And in fact, when I started searching for sites up there, I was working with Max Walter and some of the streams suggested, you know, I look at them and I want to say a couple of them were classified as trout streams, but you look at them and it looked like a bass pond. And, you know, one of the concerns in going in and removing dams from a stream like that is if it's at the point where there's just no trout left there, yeah. removing the dam is not going to bring trout back by itself. Um, so recovery is not going to happen on its own, but we would have to put the fish back in there. That, that's been another thing I was really impressed with. I dealt with some of those streams that had probably gone too long with beaver colonization before we intervened. And then you were left with such a mess. No trout there and habitat was completely trashed. They were well without the, outside the zone of what we even had the technology to deal with. Particularly, particularly complex systems that involve headwater spring ponds, like uh, say the grindstone spring system up in the LCO reservation, tributary to, to grindstone lake. I mean, we did, we, we have, we're, we're in the process of recovering that, but it's been like a 25 to 30 year process to even get the system back up and running. And there are genetic issues involved in some of these streams, I think, you know, I think this migration thing is real. And I think if you limit the trout population in any one section of stream to a low number of fish, you're just not getting your below critical stock size. You're not getting the right amount of uh, genetic diversity. And it's, the stream is not, a, the trout population is not able to contend with stresses over the long term, which by the way, the number one is 
One is, is climate change and climate change resiliency and uh, Beaver Dam do not do not factor in to make make it very uh, <laughs> the 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 outlook look very good for trout relative to climate change. Yeah, I'm curious, uh, Matt. Uh, there was a comment here about how often beavers move on, and and you know a lot of times they'll they'll build a dam and they'll kind of chew through all the wood, and and when they they use up all the food in that area, they they just move on, and then like what happens with that dam or or it is is the way the beaver like migrate through the habitat is that part of the study or is there a way to take that into account um kind of indirectly i suppose um when we started this i did have a wildlife counterpart in the project nathan roberts but he moved on to a new position in missouri so i don't have that wildlife counterpart anymore so there's no one really studying. I don't even know if he would have done that anyway, but no one's studying beaver specifically to see what they're doing. Um, it could be that one of the reasons we're not seeing as many on a lot of our northern streams is because of that habitat issue. You know, things do change in forested areas and maybe it's just not conducive to supporting beaver at the, this time. Conversely, the driftless area, um, a lot of those streams is just endless willows and I couldn't imagine beaver ever running out of food in those areas. Um, we do see dams that get abandoned um, and it could be, maybe they moved on for some reason, like you said, food or whatever, um, maybe they got trapped, we don't know. Um, but you do see that when dams are not maintained and flows change, the way the dams function change. Too. So that's something we're trying to look at as well. Yeah. Well, I think we'll leave it. I think we're going to leave it there tonight. Um, it's about 10 after nine. I know you got to prepare for the symposium tomorrow. Uh, Matt's going to give a, a slightly briefer presentation than he gave tonight. I think the, the setup tomorrow is like 20 or 30 minute presentations, right? Yep. Yeah. So Jason dropped the link in the chat. I would encourage you all to at least check that out and see what's going on tomorrow during the day. Um, it's just, I think there's like eight or nine different presentations. They're, they're short, they're quick. You can hop in and hop out. So pick a couple that are interesting to you. Um, check that out. And then uh, again, if you miss anything tomorrow, I'm sure all of that's going to get put up on the, uh, on the TU Dare YouTube channel. So look for those in the future. Um, Matt, thanks again for, for hanging out with us tonight and explaining you know, what's going on in the research world. And, uh, and we hope to have you back in the future to, you know, after you get maybe another year of data or, um, or whenever you feel comfortable maybe making some conclusions or, or you know, if there's some, some big changes you know, in the study that you find, you know, we, we'd be happy to have you back on to discuss that. So thanks again. Yeah, happy to do that. Thanks for having me on. Excellent. Thanks, everybody. Really appreciate it. Um, stay well, stay safe. We'll, uh, we'll see you out on some of these trout streams. All right. Very good. Thanks a lot, Matt. Very